have a YouTube channel called Content Foods. We're in our 50s and both of us have a college education and long careers. Mine is in education, EGIPS is in financial services. We have five grown children between us and they are on their way doing their things, uh, pursuing educations or careers. I came from a family of four children and EGIP came from a family of nine children. Both of us are from working middle class backgrounds. Both of our, both sets of parents uh, worked business owners. My parents owned a restaurant and EGIP's uh, father had many businesses. Our channel documents our transition from suburban or city life to an off-grid homestead. And our channel focuses mainly on the activities that we're undertaking to actually make that transition to off-grid homestead living. Some other things we do, we like to document our exposure to the skills and the new experiences we're going to need in a um, homesteading situation. Chickens, uh, canning, vegetables, canning meat, uh, making soap, and more self-sufficient things that one would try to have on a homestead. We have gone foraging for wild fruit. We have a garden. I am going to be working on a solar oven. We do other entertaining things like cooking videos, um, educational videos, videos about our adventures. Each month I like to make a video about all the places we've been during that month and different things we've seen or different experiences. We have all sorts of videos pertaining to our journey to becoming an off-grid homestead. It's our intention to build our own homestead from scratch. So where we can and where we're permitted to by law, our goal is to do the work ourselves. We're trying to build our own homestead, avoiding input from contractors or other professionals where we can and just enjoy doing it ourselves and with the help of good friends. Some things we can't do without contractors. For instance, the well. We could not drill the water well ourselves. That is against code. Um, the second thing we could not do is the septic evaluation. So those two things we have um, contracted out. For as long as I can remember, I wanted a piece of uh, land or a property, uh, you know, sort of an estate uh, that I could give a, a formal name to in the same way uh, that names were given to, you know, the old world properties or even colonial American properties like Monticello or Montpellier or, or Mount Vernon or something like that. But the name contentment, I think, best expresses the change in our personal way of thinking about uh, our lives, our transition to off-grid living, away from stressful city life, and to a less stressful existence off-grid. So we adopted, you know, sort of as our, our motto, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 8, where it says, Godliness with contentment is great gain, because we came into the world with nothing, and it's sure that we're you know, not going to leave with anything. And when you consider how fragile Ameri the American economy and American society is these days, we think that contentment is a good attitude to have. We have a wholesome distrust of government. We think every American should, by the way. The Founding Fathers certainly did. What people would willingly give up half of their hard-earned income to government that, you know, turns it around and uses it to make our lives more miserable? It seems like Americans do it every day. We're not anti-government people. We're not haters. It's just that we would like to see Less, Less of, of it. it. <laughs> we like roads and bridges too, mm -hmm. but not at any price, and certainly not if it means that we have to give up our freedoms for them. So, people know better what to do with their lives and their own 
families and money than the government does. We also distrust the modern phenomenon of government and corporation handshaking that's taking place that tends to strip citizens of their freedoms and basically plunders our wealth. A utility company, for instance, that has an exclusive right or monopoly upon a particular county or municipality or something like that, which compels its citizens to buy their service. There are now more people employed by the United States federal government than by any other employer in the world. There are more people employed by or because of the federal government than any other employer in the United States. Bureaucratic jobs make up a very large portion of gut jobs across the board from uh, municipalities on up through the federal level. And of course, with those types of jobs, you don't really have anything to stimulate the economy. In the past 70 years, the United States has transformed from a country where there was almost no participation by government in the marketplace to where now it is the predominant actor in the economy. Washington, D.C. is one of the fastest growing cities in the world. Even one of the big government founding fathers, Alexander Hamilton, probably would not appreciate the scope and size that this government has reached. Yeah, Alexander Hamilton, I guess, is what you might call hawkish in the modern sense. But I think even he would be shocked at how government has run into the lives of people in this country and, and in the West generally. But, you know, it's happening so gradually and so incrementally that people really haven't noticed it. Another example of this corporate government mix are traffic cameras. They're in all the major cities. If you run a red light, they'll send you a ticket in the mail and you pay it to the city. Well, most cities are not running those traffic cameras. The private corporation is. And then the city receives 60 to 70% of the revenue from the ticket and the other percentage goes to pay the company for the service they're providing the city for you know, monitoring the cameras and so forth. Mm -hmm. These companies inject their tentacles further and further into the government and it becomes this big entwined system. And a lot of people to me talk about, well, big government, big business, really, is there a difference? Yeah, you know, there's a definite intertwining of the two with what I guess people call crony capitalism today. You used to not have to have a license to be a welder. You just went and apprenticed, learned your skill, and that was okay. Now, those trades require extensive licensing fees, which is a way for the government to tax you. So people don't see it as a tax, but any kind of a license is a tax. Yeah, until about 40 years ago, 50 years ago, something like that, you didn't need a license or a permit to be a taxi cab driver or a hairdresser. Basically licensing, marriages, marriage licenses, driver's licenses, all of those things really don't safeguard the public. They really just generate revenue for the government. They do. And they create these gigantic bureaucracies which require government funding uh, in order to keep going. And so it's really just a tax on people. And then the bureaucracy grows as more and more little tentacles enter into it, you know? So you have a teacher certification test. Well, now you have to have a group of people to administer it. Now you have to have a group of people who watch the certification process. So the minute government gets involved in any of these things, it just grows. It's a mushroom. Now you need a license or a permit or need to pay a fee for just about anything in life that you want to do. And the net effect is actually less freedom now to enter the workforce. Sure, a tax for this is a great idea, but then you tax that, then we're going to tax this because this too is a great idea. And I know the stories. I know there are many countries around the globe that have like 50% tax rate and people are absolutely happy there. To me, the taxation we have here from city level through federal level is stifling. The tendency of government is just to grow, which is the way it is. We want to reduce our exposure. The less you have, the less the government gets. 
The less money you make, the less money the government gets. Yeah, that's the long and the short. The of it. smaller the house you have, the less money the government gets. Mm -hmm. Our plan is to starve them out. That's our plan. Don't get us wrong here. We're not tax evaders. We're going to pay the government what we should, um, but less is better. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and this, incidentally, is one reason why we chose Contentment's location where we did. It's in one of the poorest counties of the United States. And because it's one of the poorest counties, it doesn't yet, yet have the wherewithal or the resources to make everyone's life miserable through more ordinances, more fees, more subscriptions, more taxes, things like that. Who's to say it won't get there eventually, but at least right now, it's not too bad. We're attempting to reduce our spending with organizations that derive their income primarily because of legislation or government fiat or something like that. So if you haven't guessed by now, Rob and I are kind of rebellious. <laughs> You're not going to find us joining any militia groups or, you know, tax evasion groups or anything like that. We're pretty independent people. And that's another, another reason why, you know, we, uh, this, uh, this kind of lifestyle appeals to us. Robert and I are becoming increasingly disenchanted with the trappings of modern society. But mostly this feeling of being herded, you know, into behaving a certain way, you know, being on that treadmill, doing the nine to five, uh, you know, buying insurance, buying stuff, uh, and just generally feeling like you're nothing but a machine. What appears to most people as a step downward is really and truly a step upward because we are able to live on less with less and have a more fulfilling life that way. And simplicity is something that I really, really want to bring into my life. Debt-free is a super hard thing to do now because everything is so expensive, but the less expensively you live, the less debt you have. It gives us more time for family, friends, church. Through most of my adult life, I've had the career, the drive, the job, all of that kind of stuff, and did the things that society said I should be doing. I bought a home, took my kids to softball, wrestling, all of that. And I'm not saying that that's a bad thing. I enjoyed that. The kids benefited from it. But now, with the children being older, it's a time where we can simplify things. We were upwardly mobile and all those things that the society wants you to be, right? I lived in a larger than average home, lived a middle class lifestyle, the kids went to dance and you know all those kinds of things that you're supposed to do. I, I worked hard and tried to stay on top of the production goals and play in the game. But one day it hit me that so much of my energy in life, and so much by the way of American life, so much of our energy goes into making things appear great instead of actually being great. So I decided that my best belongs to me, my best whatever, my best self, my best production, my best work, my best person uh, belongs to me and I wanna spend it how I wanna spend it, not how the rest of the world wants me. In today's society, the importance of credit scores, keeping your credit up and encouraging debt, debt here, debt there. You don't want to be in debt. Consolidate your credit cards with a personal loan. I mean, it's still debt. Hey, I want that little shiny gold trinket over there. I don't care that I don't have the money to pay for it. I'll pay it back later. And so that starts this dependency, this cycle that you get into, and it's very difficult to get out of that, that debt trap. Now, when we pull up on a street corner and we see a new business going up, a new building coming up, and they have a and they have a sign out there, you know, it says coming soon, you know, some new restaurant or something like that. Robert and I turn to each other and joking, they say coming soon, a new pile of debt, because that's what it is. I mean, it's a disposable economy. It's a disposable good thing because that keeps you on that spend, spend, spend cycle. You know, you're compelled to use or take advantage of inferior services. 
um, you know, like the DMV. <laughs> or even worse, some kind of, you know, modern healthcare where you just go visit the doctor, he throws a pill at it, and you owe him $150. You know, the American economy is really on an unsustainable course. We are spending money faster than we can print it. 44% of all American households now are unable to meet their basic expenses and are going into debt just to meet their basic household expenses. 80% of all Americans now are living paycheck to paycheck. Rents are rising. Home ownership rates are falling. The cost of owning a home is going way up and just about to the point where it doesn't make financial sense to buy a home anymore or to keep a home because of the costs associated with keeping and maintaining a home. And at the same time, wages are stagnant. Um, prices are rising or product sizes are downsizing and government at every level, state, county, federal, local, it's all growing. There's no such thing as finding a real value or a true value for things anymore, a real price, they call it. Um, because everything is so distorted by debt that there's just no finding a real price. A compact car that cost $4,000 in 1975 now costs $24,000 in 2019. There, there really is no such thing as a free market anymore. I believe that the world economy is in for a serious day of reckoning and even economic catastrophe, and I believe it'll happen or trigger pretty soon. In fact, I'm afraid that Robert and I may not have enough time to get out to contentment and to have everything in place before it happens. Common sense should tell everyone that you cannot just spend and spend and spend without having the money to cover that debt. It's not practical in a personal household and it's not practical on a government level. We're already beginning to see the cracks forming in our economy and our infrastructure. The main utility company in California is blacking out power uh, to residents. Uh, cities and counties all over the United States are beginning to declare bankruptcy or are on the verge of bankruptcy. And so what Robert and I are doing is trying to prepare for what we see as the inevitable collapse. By taking this deliberate step downward uh, in our household economy, we're preempting what we think is going to happen to the entire country here pretty soon. But unlike what's going to happen to people when things finally collapse, we get to do this on our own terms. We are voluntarily lowering our standard of living. So when SFHT happens, we're already in the SHFT. That includes growing our own food, raising animals, whatever it takes. Uh, trading for goods and services. Um, bartering for us would be a great way to do things now, but nobody wants to. Mm -hmm. Bartering is a great idea because you get closer to the actual or real value, or the real price of things, unlike using paper money. All of this also includes taking more responsibility for our own health and health care, um, trying to eat better so we are not going to require the diabetes medicine, the high cholesterol medicine, the high blood pressure medicine, stay more active, make a more positive lifestyle change that way. I have no intention of living in a nursing home. Yeah, I don't either. And again, I was just talking about that today. Hopefully I stay active. I mean, and that's the key. If you live this kind of a lifestyle, a more sustainable lifestyle where you're tending animals or, or gardening or things like that, you stay more active. And that is probably one of the top ways to keep a healthier lifestyle. It also means that you know, we get to enjoy life more. We have more time with friends or the things that we would enjoy doing. You know, church, volunteering, um, those kinds of things. So. Family get-togethers if they'll come and see us. Robert and I, we love 
elbow room. We love wide open spaces. Uh, we enjoy having, you know, a little distance from our neighbors. Um, we like having land that's usable that, you know, we can enjoy and do things on. Uh, we like the versatility that comes with that. I especially enjoy the quietness. Cities are risky and downright dangerous places to be in the event of a war, a national emergency, any kind of crisis. They're just not where you want to be. Uh, if a major economic downturn occurs uh, suddenly, or if there's a sudden crisis, you know, something like that, they are literally dangerous places. I personally have seen how quickly things can deteriorate in a city or in any densely populated area. We like challenges and learning new things, being outside, doing physical labor, having projects because all of those things stimulate mind, body, and soul. And again, it's one of those ways to help, hopefully, extend a more youthful old age. <laughs> we enjoy physical labor. We like doing things with our hands. We like making, building, fixing things. Uh, we're not afraid of it. We just jump right in and do it. We, we kind of like it. Anyone doing this has to not be afraid of risk and because you're you're going off into the unknown you're doing something that is not considered normal or whatever and it is going to be risky but you can't be afraid of it if you want to do this and your motivations are there I say go for it if you can I don't think anybody who 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 attempts a radical change would be sad that they do most of the time unless it's utter disaster <laughs> but you just have to be willing to embrace that risk because the risks can be huge with a major lifestyle change, especially if you're going to go live off grid in a remote area or a rural area uh, and homestead and you've been living in the city all of your life or the suburbs or something like that, like we have mostly. It could mean a change in your friends. Obviously, it'll mean a change in your living arrangements. It'll mean a change in your income, your uh, probably your socioeconomic status, uh, all kinds of things. And so you really need to think about it and be sure that you're willing to assume those risks because they're quite high. Each of and I were discussing the other day what homesteading is. The Homestead Act came about to encourage the settlement of the West and these big wide open spaces. And lots of people went out there, land speculators, got the land, sold it, made money. But a lot of people went out there to own the land because the wealth was in the land. And the Homesteading Act was going out and making a life on that homestead. Yeah, there were a lot of land speculators back then, for sure, just like there are today. There were still a lot of people who, you know, we give them colorful names now, like sodbusters and people like that. Uh, people who actually went out, occupied the land, and did logging, mining, farming, whatever. And whether they eventually sold those properties off, or whether they remained in the families for generations... They still homesteaded. They made it work. They built something from scratch, from the ground up, and they, and they subsisted off of the land. I like to say they made a life there. And that life was basically on that homestead for the most part. Mm -hmm. There was a time when homesteading was a verb, but now is a noun. And what we mean by that is, in our society today, it's pretty easy to sort of have insta-homestead. You know, all I have to do is go to a conference and learn someone's technique for raising chickens, buy into their program, or literally buy their program, um, buy some chickens, buy stuff, put it on my backyard, and I have, and I'm a homesteader. You know? Don't get us wrong. There's nothing wrong with that. But... I think the true idea of what homesteading looked like historically has been lost. It's changed. Um, well, yes. Yeah. And you hear things like, I made $250,000 growing microgreens on my quarter acre. 
And that sounds great. And if you do, that's awesome. But that's really not what the historical idea of homesteading looked like. Yeah, I think about all the homesteading conferences that are popping up all over the country. You know, leave it to we Americans to commercialize it. But there are homesteaders in the third world, in developing countries, who are practicing homesteading and they don't hold conferences or sell their 10 point plan for success with chickens or you know, whatever it is. They just homestead. Mm -hmm. But those people, that is their life. That is what they know. That is how they live. A lot of the world works on a market-based sort of economic system where if you are a farmer, you're selling your crops for money. And the idea of, I made $250,000 on my homes to you know, one quarter acre homestead selling microgreens really isn't uh, homesteading. It's a small scale commercial farm. Robert and I would define homesteading as what was traditionally known as diversified subsistence farming. In other parts of the world, it's called small holding, where uh, a person or a family owns a small piece of land, usually five acres or less, and literally sustains themselves on that land, growing a garden, uh, raising animals for food. And then if there's any excess, they could sell it, trade for it, whatever. But primarily, they make their living directly off of their small holding. There may be a case where a family member leaves the homestead for a day, a week, a month, you know, or something like that every once in a while to gain a little money because you do have to buy some things. Uh, but for the most part, it is sustained by the produce of that small property. And that's what we would define as homesteading. Historically, homesteaders don't make money. They subsist. They live on their land to support their family. Yeah, it's really sort of a hand-to-mouth existence. But people will think you're absolutely crazy for doing that because we've all been raised under the market economic system where wages uh, provide everything you need instead of your land, your back, your sweat uh, going directly into your sustenance. You're seen as some sort of backward thinker or hippie or something for giving up a regular wage. Even modern farmers will think you're nuts because even though they grow food, it's usually a monoculture, one kind of crop, and they sell it for cash, and they're part of the market economy as well. But you know, there are 8 billion people on this planet, and 2 billion of those people still live that way under a diversified subsistence farming economic model. It is probably the most successful economic system in the history of the world. And people are still doing it. It can be done, uh, even in place of a market economy. Living more sufficiently or having a subsistence garden or life will, could really help in the case of an economic downturn. Um, you know, as, as you might have heard people say, these people who lived that life during the Great Depression never really knew that they were the, in a Great Depression because nothing changed for them on, a, on that big of a scale. If a severe economic downturn does happen, you will see a major shift to subsistence, diversified subsistence farming or homesteading um, as a way to obtain at least food security uh, during tough economic times. And Robert's right, during the depression, one of the common things you heard among farmers was that, you know, we didn't have any money, but at least we ate well. So I think that this recent upsurge in interest in things like prepping, homesteading, self-sufficiency, uh, things like that is a response to a perceived or real, in, in the case of some people, a financial downturn that we believe is going to hit the country. And in fact, you know, Robert and I know people that for economic reasons uh, have chosen to homestead. 
Um, there are other reasons for doing it, for health and things like that. But uh, for some people, it's an economic necessity, and it seems to work well for them. It doesn't hurt to become more self-sufficient um, and to garden and do things like that. It may People may not appreciate it. They may think you're strange, but there's certainly nothing wrong with it. And especially if you can provide a little more for yourself, that that you can grow and not have to spend your money on. Mm -hmm. What advice would I give someone considering this? Hmm. Well, honestly, I don't necessarily think I'm in the best position to give advice because I'm so new to this. But I would advise someone to be clear on what they want their homestead to look like. It's really going to take a change in mindset because you're really going against all the things that most people have been taught as important and taught to be a successful citizen. Don't try to jump in and do everything in a year. If you want to say put pigs on your homestead, make sure they fit don't add something that doesn't fit where you are and make sure you know all you can about pigs or whatever it is you're going to add to your homestead. Don't jump in all at once. We are continuing to work to maintain some kind of cash income because we're going to need it. Um, even the most successful subsistence farmers still have a sprinkling of income from somewhere. Uh, neither the government nor society are going to let you get completely away <laughs> from things that you have to pay them. And so you're going to need that money. And we recommend that you, even no matter how meager it is, uh, you know, or no matter how little you work, try to find some outside work or sources of trade or something like that where you have some cash income coming in. Get that free downsize and get involved in some sort of homesteading community. Make friends. Yeah, that is so important because any change of lifestyle requires, um, you know, social support, emotional support, things like that. And when you're making this big a change, you need those people to come alongside you um, and help. I mean, I know Robert and I have found them very valuable. Allow me to elaborate a little bit on, on what we mean by downsizing. Um, that means downsizing economically. It means lowering our tax burden. It means lowering, it means eliminating our debt. It means downsizing our lives financially, economically, and in many other ways, materially. I mean, we are making a deliberate effort to shrink everything, deliberately getting rid of some assets. We're getting rid of the ones that are costing us money, either in maintenance and taxes and or <laughs> are depreciating in value. So it only makes sense to get rid of some of those assets. Depending on where you live, real estate can be a depreciating asset for you. Or if the market is stagnating and your homeowner's insurance rates are going up and your taxes are going up, your home, even though it's free and clear, is not much of an asset to you and it's it's a it's a dwindling asset to you so you may consider actually selling a home maybe even one that you own free and clear never never going into debt again and i realize that some people are going to say what i mean what happens if somebody gets sick what happens if there's an emergency what happens if someone dies and I can't pay and someone needs to pay for their funeral? All I'm saying is that for us, it means never, never, no never, ever going into debt for anything. And if you are going to make a life change with motivations that are not true to your desires, then you're probably not going to have the best success. They should come from really your innermost person. Whether a person realizes 
uh, what those motivations are. There are always some deep motivations in place for someone to make a, you know, a, a large life change. You really have to know yourself. Our motivations developed gradually over the years. And they've really shaped our personalities. The decision to homestead was not a quick one, and it sort of evolved gradually. Some good advice that we've heard and what we do is that we're taking the skills that we have now, using those skills, putting those things in place with what we can do now, and then building on those as we go forward into building a home or other projects on the homestead. Mm -hmm. As we have progressed through these steps, we have reconsidered some of the directions we wanted to go and changed them up. So another valuable uh, characteristic that you need is the ability to kind of evolve and change and go go with the flow a little bit. And mm -hmm. that's, that's not something strictly only for homesteading or off-grid. That's just a life skill thing there. Right. Despite the hardships that may come about, don't ever give up. I mean, sometimes it might be impossible. Some big setbacks may happen. But just keep moving forward and keep going to the goal. And If you're serious about making this change, if you thought it through, if you or any change for that matter, if you thought it through, if you are certain that this is the major life change you want to make, then you have to stick to it. Never, ever give up. Never, ever. Never, ever.